Oh, yeah. yeah. Good. So, uh, I'm very glad to have come to this meeting because I've learned an enormous amount. I'm not in ENCODE and I don't do ENCODE type experiments. So, it's actually been very useful. I've used ENCODE and it's been very useful to use it and to see how people are thinking about using it. So, I think I'll be talking about a much more focused topic than many of you have talked about. It's going to be about DNA methylation, DNA modifications. And I hope that I can bring some perspectives to what I think so far has been a very small fraction of what uh, NGOT has been doing. So that's, how do I do this? Sorry. How to move the, what? the slide. yeah, just this. Okay. this is forward. Oh, okay, perfect. Thank you. So, um, as probably all, all of you know, this is a very short introduction to DNA methylation. Methylation tends to be, oops, uh, in uh, CPG contexts and symmetrically methylated. Uh, that's about 90% of the, of the, or more, of the, C, of the CPGs and differentiated cells in the mammalian genome, probably saving neurons, which Joe Ecker has done a lot of work on non-CPG methylation. Anyway, the, uh, the methylated CPGs are in the major groove, available for binding by uh, various kinds of metal binding proteins. And the way, the standard way for DNA methylation to be erased is in fact uh, just DNA replication which replaces the methylated cytosine on the replicated strand with the plain cytosine and then DNMT1 puts it back, DNMT UHRF1 complex. And uh, basically if you prevent DNMT1 from putting the metal group back, what you get is a slow progressive replication dependent loss of DNA methylation. Now, since the TETs were discovered in our lab about uh, six years ago now, it's been clear that while DNMTs put on the metal cytosine, another mechanism for removing DNA metal uh, the DNA methylation mark is, uh, involves this progressive oxidation of metal cytosine by TET proteins to 5-hydroxymethyl, 5 5-formyl, 5 and 5-carboxycytosine. And these are all... Uh, they're all epigenetic marks, and of course they can come in combinations, so that what you have is, you can have, this is terrible. Uh, what, what you can have is different kinds of methylation marks here, so, uh, so there are 25 possible combinations for uh, epigenetic readers of different kinds to look at. Now, all of these marks, if they're opposite from the methylated cytosine, tend to prevent DNMT1 from doing the maintenance methylation. So they would, in fact, uh, interfere with maintenance DNA methylation and be a way of uh, facilitating replication-dependent DNA demethylation. And there are also some methods that uh, involve base uh, excision repair proteins like thymine DNA glycosylase, which normally takes uh, a, a base a mismatched TG dinucleotide excises it, but in this case can also recognize the perfectly well uh, base paired 5 formal and 5 carboxycytosine and excise those, and then the, those are converted back to cytosine by uh, the, uh, the base excision repair machinery. So, um, so there are a couple of other mechanisms that uh, have been suggested for uh, uh, demethylation that I won't go into because they are not as well validated. So where is 5-HMC in the genome? It's highest in gene bodies of the most highly transcribed genes, and I think you can see that uh, over here. That's the top 25, top quartile of 25% uh, of most uh, highly expressed genes. And you can see the unexpressed genes are really not enriched for 5-HMC in this uh, standard DNA affinity uh, 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 enrichment method. But, and the lowest expressed genes, you can see, are slightly enriched, but not highly. It's the most highly expressed genes that are the most highly enriched. And if you look at enhancers marked by uh, K4ME1 and K27 acetylation, the color gradient gives you how much 5-HMC there is in these enhancers. And you can see that it's the most active enhancers is defined by high levels of both marks that have the highest levels of 5-HMC. And these are all highly transcribed regions of the genome, gene bodies as well as active enhancers, as you just heard from, uh, from um, sorry, <laughs> blanking on who just spoke, sorry. Um, it's all right. Um, and it, this thing that which we've shown here in T cells is, has in fact been shown for neurons and during spermatogenesis, during erythroid differentiation. So it's actually true in many different uh, cell types. So 
Uh, this is also shown in this uh, RNA-seq 5-HMC picture, where you can see just call them cell, cell type 1 and cell type 2. They have two different kinds of cells in the thymus. And you can see that the 5-HMC levels and the RNA levels match very nicely. So these two are expressed in cell type 2, and the, this one is expressed in cell type 1. So, so basically what we were trying to do was to understand the functions of tet enzymes in mammals, and for the purpose of this talk, I'll try to relate it to what we know about DNA methylation changes. So there are three tet enzymes. Uh, we've made mice with conditional flux alleles of all of them, and we've found that the individual mutations give you relatively mild phenotypes, depending on whether you're looking at embryonic development or particular tissues. And what we uh, do know is that double and triple mutations, and we made different types and different cell types, actually give you uh, fairly striking phenotypes, such as embryonic lethality and ablation of specific lineages. So for instance, I'll, when we delete uh, TET2 and TET3 in hemopoietic cells, we lose red blood cells and we lose B cells, depending on what CRE we use. And what I'm really going to focus on today is the relation to cancer, and I'll go through it uh, fairly swiftly. So at about the same time that we were identifying the uh, enzymatic activity of TET2, uh, a different group in France showed by looking at a very small deletion in this 4Q24 region, which is often mutated in myelodysplastic syndromes and so on, that uh, one small deletion contained only the TET2 genes. And this was f followed by a flurry of whole exome sequencing that basically said the mutations were all across the TET genes, and uh, we and others have shown that these are very likely all loss of function mutations of TET proteins, of TET2. Since then, there have been any number of uh, papers relating all sorts of cancers, including solid cancers, to mutations in TET1 and TET2, or to loss of hydroxymethyl cytosine, which is a readout for all TET activity. And uh, so the question became for us, we work with model organisms, not so much to relate the mutations in human cancers to what's going on, but to see whether we could induce an acute cancer of different cell types in uh, a model organism by acutely deleting TET proteins. And this, in fact, turned out to be true. Uh, basically, we asked the question, is acute loss of TET function associated with cancer? And the answer is yes. We can't delete just one TET protein. We have to delete uh, two. And, uh, haven't yet been able to do it with three because of the embryonic lethality, but two, model, two, tet, two TET proteins definitely with TET2 and TET3 in so far. It's what we've tested because they're present to the highest extent in differentiated cells. And we've taken it out, taken out TET2 and TET3 together with either with MXI CRE followed by <laughs> double-stranded RNA injection or with CRE RT2 and tamoxifen injection. And the effects of deletion, if we do it either way, which is an acute deletion, is first seen in the hemopoietic stem cell compartment, and what we get is an aggressive myeloid leukemia. If we delete TET2 and TET3 with CD4 CRE in T cells, what we get is an aggressive antigen-driven T cell leukemia. In both of these cases, the cancer is a cell intrinsic, polyclonal, transmissible indefinitely to recipient mice, and the cancer develops really rapidly. And so we have to assume that the uh, initiating event in each one of these cases is the acute and uh, profound loss of TET function, which derives from losing this uh, hydroxymethyl cytosine and other oxidized metal cytosines in the genome, or maybe changes in DNA methylation. And so that was one of the questions we asked. We took LSK cells from hemopoietic uh, stem precursor cells, LSK cells, from mice uh, that had either been uh, either control mice or mice that had been before deletion or mice after the acute tamoxifen or CRE-RT2 treatment and did whole genome by sulfide sequencing on it. And now I'm a complete newcomer to this field. So one of the things I'm going to be uh, really presenting this data for is to solicit your opinion on whether we're doing it right. And uh, basically what we've done is taken three control uh, samples, three biological replicas of control LSK cells in three knockouts and sequenced uh, to fairly high depth, so that's 200 million reads, most of which are mappable. And the coverage in each case is about sevenfold, so that we have an overall coverage of about 21, 20 fold in each one of those cases. And that uh, translates to a pretty good coverage of CPGs in the genome. Uh, and that was validated, our choice of this sevenfold and so on was validated by this paper, which uh, is a Nature Methods paper, I believe, that tells us that uh, you need at least two replicates and you need a certain amount of depth of coverage in order to get the sequencing. So what do we find out? We find out 
that the canyons of DNA methylation, that is, that's a terminology used by Peggy Goodell, or which what Bing Wren has called valleys of DNA methylation, or some of these canyons and valleys correspond to CPG islands in the genome, do in fact, if we look at the control versus TET knockouts, do in fact shrink in terms of getting extra methylation at the edges, and this has been called CPG, uh, methylation of CPG island shores for what it's worth. And that's true of both of these genes, and if we look at what both of these genes do, both of them down, are down-regulated in TET knockout cells relative to wild type. The promoter regions of both of these genes are actually uh, present within the valleys, and I think that's shown here. And uh, so one could take this handful of genes which shows this behavior and say, well, we've shown that there are uh, methylation-associated gene expression changes, and therefore this uh, sort of explains the phenotype. I would rather say that if you look at a whole genome level, however, we, the changes that we see are really mild. So for instance, here are three replicates, so those are three lines of uh, the controls and three lines of the TET knockouts, and what you can see over here is all across the genome you see an increase in methylation, but it's not really very striking at this average level at all. And that's also true for active enhancers, it's a little higher there, but basically the uh, level of DNA methylation that we see is not not uh, change in DNA methylation is not very high. We can also look at this, so in the previous slide I was looking at it, uh, at all genes, so that's 21,000 genes, a lot of those are not expressed, and we then focused our attention on the differentially expressed genes in both of these uh, cell types, and you can see once again, there's a minor change in the average uh, level of DNA methylation. So what Edahi Avalos and Lucas uh, Chavez, our bioinformatics colleagues did, was basically to sum up the methylation at the transcription start site and in the three quarters of the end of the, this model gene body, and then plot those values in a sort of a, a dot plot, where each dot here then represents one region of the genome. And what you can see over here is if you look at each one of these dots, there's as the trend is towards increased methylation in the TET knockouts, but only about a 20% change in uh, methylation overall. And if you look at upregulated genes and downregulated genes, there are about twice as many upregulated as downregulated genes. And you can see that in both cases, they gain methylation. So we're not seeing that methylation is making any change either at the transcription start site or in the gene body to overall gene methylation. There are some genes that follow the pattern. Over here are genes that. Uh, are, uh, goodness, upregulated and lose methylation, and here are genes that are downregulated and gain methylation, but overall there's really no particular pattern. So what are we to make of this? I don't really know at this point. Are we to focus on the small subset of genes that does show the kinds of changes we quote unquote expect, or are we to look at the entire pattern and say that we may be changing the metabolic state of the cell, uh, but we don't really know. However, uh, that's probably, um, a reasonable question for later, but what I would like to point out to you is that, in fact, the measurements that we're making with this whole genome by sulfide sequencing don't distinguish 5-MC from 5-HMC, because what happens is that neither of these gets deaminated upon sodium bisulfide treatment. Similarly, uh, C, FC, and CAC all do get deaminated and turned into D upon sodium bisulfide treatment, and therefore these are all read as C after amplification and conversion. And really, uh, since the numbers of FC and CAC and fleece and mouse yes cells are very low, what we should at least be trying to do is distinguish 5-MC from 5-HMC. So the recommendations for this uh, first part of the talk are uh, basically to include OxyMC or at least 5-HMC measurements in any of the DNA methylation analyses that ENCODE might be contemplating doing in the future. Um, so as I told you, 5-MC and 5-HMC can be distinguished by certain techniques such as TAB-seq and OxBS-seq, but these are really too expensive to uh, do and uh, on a routine basis they require about 10 times as much coverage as simply whole genome by sulfide mapping, so one would have to do it at an aplicon level. And uh, also remember that we are talking about five new cytosine, cytosine bases, unmodified 5-MC, 5-HMC, 5-FC, and 5-CAC, but the change is uh, binary, whereas what we're looking at when we say a change in methylation level is a change at, at the population level. And there's some undefined proportion have changed state. Um, so uh, the other thing we 
probably ought to do is include perturbations in kinetic measurements. These changes seem to be much more dynamic than we had previously uh, appreciated. Oops. Um, and they may happen on very rapid timescales. And finally, I think one really should encourage the development of new sequencing methods to map modified cytosines in unamplified genomic DNA. And that would include, ideally, long reads so as to allow uh, unambiguous mapping of repetitive regions of the genome. Am I finished? Uh, one small section. One minute. One minute. OK. So I want to bring up the idea that one should also be looking at primary cells that are available in small numbers. And in order to do that, what we did was look at a phenomenon called T-cell exhaustion, which is observed in chronic viral infections and in tumor infiltrating cells, and appears to result from prolonged exposure to antigen, and is important in the context of certain immunodeficiencies. Mm -hmm. And what I'm just showing you here is some attack-seek data that are looking at naive cells, affected cells, and exhausted cells in a, in a region and what you can see over here, looking at these tiny numbers of cells, only about five times 10 to four cells, is that there are, in fact, regions that are accessible to exhausted cells in vivo in the, in the chronic viral infection context and uh, do not appear when you stimulate the T cells in vitro. So I think something like this should be incorporated into the, uh, uh, the flow for uh, attack C. And you can see over here that the same peaks show up in cells that are tumor infiltrating and also exposed to antigen and don't show up in vice standard cells in the tumor. And so I'll uh, skip forward and just uh, tell you about uh, my collaborators. I think uh, Arvind actually is a very uh, important resource at, uh, uh, on, the, on the NIH campus. And these are the people who did the work on uh, the hemopoietic cells. And this is the person who did the work on the T cell cancer. And these are our bioinformatic colleagues whom I've tended to mention. Thank you. So again, because we are still 10 minutes away from where we should be, I guess we need a moment to do, a, to do some recalibration of the AV. Um, but our next speaker will be John O'Shea, who will ask us not what well, ask not what you can do for ENCODE, but what ENCODE can do for you.